Uh, good morning, everybody. From my side, uh, two thanks a lot for the invitation uh, from the organizers, especially Mike, inviting me to come uh, to this meeting. It's a, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. So as Bobo said, the title of this session is Programmable Soft Matter. And in fact, what I'll try to do in the next half hour or so is to show you some of the work that we've done in, in our group to um, see how much we can control basically and program the response of active uh, colloidal systems. And I will show you two different approaches that, uh, that we've used that will become apparent hopefully throughout the talk. The first one is to program the response and the motility of active particles by using photoresponsive materials. And the second one actually uses uh, thermoresponsive materials to change the shape uh, of active particles and therefore reconfigure their motility in, in a programmable way. Um, to the audience, I don't really need to introduce active matter, but just very briefly, what I would consider in sort of a very simple sort of distilled uh, definition, active matter systems, we consider them to be systems that are able to intake energy that is available, either in, in form of a chemical uh, fuel or in, in terms of harvesting energy from external fields and transforming or translating this, this uh, available energy primarily into directed motion and then into a range of different um, functionalities. And so, of course, if we think about this, the best example of it are living materials. This is a movie that is often showed in, in, liquid, in, in active matter uh, uh, contest. This is a macrophage. It is a cell that is performing a task, which is to eat that little bacteria that is, uh, that is following. Uh, and this is a system that, as you can see, has a high complexity at a small scale. So these objects are about 10 to 20 microns in diameter. And they have a programmable motility. Uh, they're, they're programmed for the job of eating these bacteria, which is just happened uh, right now. Um, and this is encoded basically in, in the genetic uh, information that is encoded into the cell. And so if we want to try and replicate that at a, at a synthetic level, uh, if we want to have this programmable motility or functionality of these objects, we have to uh, endow basically these objects with, with, these, with these properties. And, and primarily, this boils, boils down to having systems that have some form of a feedback between sensing a certain, a certain stimulus, in this case, it's the presence of the bacterium and the chemical traces that are left by it, and then respond and adapt the motility to that in a programmable way. Okay? And that's really at the core of, uh, of this idea. The fact is that can we do that as humans? And the answer is yes, but at a large scale. So we can produce complex machinery that is autonomously able to, com to perform very complex functions. So you can have a, a robot that dances like Mick Jagger and learns how to dance like, like Mick Jagger. So we can do that and we can hard code basically the responses and the complex functionality into a machine, but this machine is on a microscopic scale. Now the question is, can we do that at the micro scale, right? Well, how do we do that at the micro scale? So before anyone gets too excited, I'm not going to show you colleagues that can dance like Mick Jagger. I apologize for this, but actually the inspiration comes much more from this type of machine that is a much simpler machine. So this is like a coin operated turnstile that you find sort of in restrooms in, 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 in the motorway when you go to the toilet. And that is a very simple machine that has very simple functionality, but it's sort of in distinct internal states. OK, so the first one that you can have as an internal state is a state where you put the coin in and then the arm of the turnstile turns and then the coin drops in. And then you go into the second state where the coin is out and then the arm doesn't turn anymore. And this transitions between these two distinct, uh, well-defined finite states is reversible. You keep put, putting coins in and you can go back to the, initial, uh, to the initial state. What is interesting to point out here, and this is something that I will refer to uh, frequently throughout the talk, is that in this case, let's say the powering of the machine is independent from the stimulus that triggers the, the, the transition between the states. So the machine is always plugged into the mains, the machine is always on, so to say, but then it's the orthogonal, if you wish, stimulus of introducing a coin that makes it transition from state one to state two, and therefore changes the, uh, the response of the machine or the function of the machine itself independently. So how do we do that at a colloidal scale? Um, let's first sort of philosophically, I would say it is inspired in, in a way that is similar to this uh, turnstile, uh, coin operated turnstile. So what we're going to do, and I will show you that in two examples, is that we're going to produce colloids that essentially have distinct internal states that you can transition to reversibly from one another. And each state is then associated to a certain, let's say, let's call it motility. Okay. In this case, I'm using temperature as the stimulus. I will also show you later this can, that we can do it also by light. But essentially, we can think about the systems as basically 
being a particle that is in an initial state, and then we reconfigure it and transition to a second state, and by doing that, you change the material. And then if we have materials that respond differently to the same stimulus, let's say at different critical values of a temperature, we can have different levels, let's say, of reconfiguration. And if we can combine these things together, then we can build up, let's say, machines that are composed by more complex numbers or higher number of, of internal states, and therefore, where we have a more, let's say, more flexibility in the range of, of uh, programmability that we can introduce into the systems. So this is the very uh, sort of generic uh, scheme that I would like to sort of to set up for the, the systems or the materials that I'm going to present uh, to you today. And now let's try to go into some uh, more details. So how do we approach this? So we approach this by taking um, objects that, uh, uh, that are self-propelled by the presence of so-called electrohydrodynamic flows. So in this case, what you have to think about is that you take a dielectric particle, you place it close to an electrode, and then you apply a transverse electric field across these electrodes. So there's a narrow gap between the two electrodes in the fluid in uh, approximately, let's say, the kilohertz range. And by doing that, you're polarizing the particle. Uh, and then by, by virtue of the fact that you have a spherical object close to the electrode, then locally you get tangential components of the electric field, which then causes recirculation of ions around that particle. And this is what are called electrohydrodynamic flows. Um, now, if you look at such an, a system where you have a, a homogeneously um, composed, so a, a sphere that is homogeneous in material composition, and it is spherical, so it is an isotropic object, these recirculation flows around the particle are symmetric. So if I add them all up around the perimeter of the particle, I get a net zero flow, and that particle doesn't move. Now, if I break the symmetry of that object, either by changing the shape of the object, so if I break the shape symmetry, or if I change the material composition such that the, the object is no longer compositionally uniform, then the um, magnitude of these flows are gonna be different, let's say, on the two sides of this object. So if I sum them all up, then there's a net fluid flow that will propel the particle in the direction of the flow wave symmetry. And this type of propulsion mechanisms, it lends itself very nicely to the idea of programming the response, as I was mentioning before, because this velocity ui that I plot here is the characteristic velocity of, the, uh, of this electrohydrodynamic flows evaluated at a distance small r away from an object that has a radius uh, r, big r i. And so this depends on two material properties of the, uh, of the particle. It depends on these uh, uh, constants k prime and k double prime. So these are so-called closest Mosotti factors. These are the real and imaginary part of the um, polarizability of the particle relative to the polarizability of the surrounding medium. And it depends on Ri, which is the, uh, the dimension of the object itself. So now if I have systems of which I can change in a programmable way the dielectric properties, and if I have a material for which I can change in a programmable way the, uh, a size change or a shape change based on an orthogonal stimulus, then I have an object that has a propulsion that I can reconfigure independently from the, the mechanism that actually drives the propulsion itself. And so that's going to be uh, the, 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 the strategy that we're going to use to achieve this programmable uh, motility. So in the first part of the talk, I'm going to tell you how we do that by using light uh, and by reconfiguring specifically the dielectric properties of particles by, uh, by using light. And in the second part of the talk, I will tell you how we then use temperature to actually change the shape uh, of this object and henceforth uh, um, uh, program or modify the propulsion. And then towards the end, I will show you uh, what sort of is the underlying idea where we want to go with this. Uh, and, and, and we are just you know building these systems up. So I think we're now approaching the point where we can, after building up the material systems, try to develop um, uh, systems of which we start to control the collective behavior by controlling, by programming basically the response of motility at the single particle level. And then I'll leave you with some uh, outlook uh, for, for the future. So by the way, a lot of what I'm going to show you today has not been published yet. I just wanted to share with you in, in the spirit of trying to stimulate some interesting discussions and if anybody has any feedback or any, uh, or any ideas uh, of, uh, um, of can be inspired by what I'm showing today, I'd be very happy to discuss this with, with all of you. So let's start with the first, uh, with the first example. So in this case, uh, what I wanted to see is that if we, if, if we had a material of which we can control externally uh, the, the conductivity. And so in this case, what we've done is that we've taken titanium dioxide, 
So titanium dioxide is a fossil sensitive semiconductor material. So if you illuminate titanium, titanium dioxide or titania with the right uh, light, so typically this is UV light of a wavelength of around 365 nanometers, then you promote the creation of electron hole pairs, which then bumps up the conductivity of the material. And in this case, uh, we can test that. And so this is an, an experiment that my student Willie has done recently in the lab. In the top figure, uh, what you see is a photograph where there is a that small square is a thin film of titanium dioxide deposited onto an insulating material. And the two black patches that you see are two gold electrodes that provide an electrical contact. And then we apply a voltage across that, uh, that titanium dioxide film and measure the, cor the current that goes through. Okay, And then we illuminate the, the material with the UV light of different intensity, and then we see basically what happens. And what we see here, and this is a material that has a light dependent conductivity. So the graph is a very recent graph, so the units are not uh, perfect yet. Uh, these different numbers that you see with the arrows correspond to the intensity of the UV lamp that we've used. So 1023 is the highest intensity that we have. This is in, 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 in bits. Uh, and then you see that as we reduce stepwise the light intensity, the current that goes through also decreases stepwise. And then we go to a minimum of the current that goes through uh, with the highest resistivity, so the lowest conductivity of that film. If we have zero UV light, and then we go back up and then we recover the initial uh, conductivity. So this is now interesting for us because if we produce Janus particles that we only coat half with such titania hemisphere, then these particles are uh, silica titania particles, whereas the silica, the surface of the silica, doesn't change its conductivity when we shine the UV light, but the titania does. And so here, we have a system, if we go back to the propulsion mechanism that I was mentioning before, of which we can control the dielectric properties by shining UV light of different intensity. So this light-dependent conductivity is the gateway to sort of the light-dependent propulsion and the pro programmability of the response. So this is an, ex uh, an example of an experiment. And so what you're going to see here, these are such Janus particles that are moving on top of the electrodes, okay? And then as we shine the UV light, then you will see that the proportion of these particles are that. So these are some of the early experiments, so quite a few of the particles are actually stuck on the substrate. And you see that the particles swim in the characteristic active variant motion uh, pattern, and we switch off the UV light, and all of a sudden, the motility of this particle drops. This is different from the case of photocatalytically active titania particles, or titania swimmers that people have looked at, because in that case, the UV light is actually the, the, the means by which the, the propulsion takes place. In, this, in, in these experiments, the electric field is constant. Okay? So we have an electric field of 10 volts at a frequency of 8 kilohertz, and that is fixed. So we are driving the particles always with the same driving force, but we are reconfiguring their uh, properties, their material properties, by shining UV light. And as you can see, this is reversible, and we can do that over uh, multiple cycles. So just to look into a little, a little bit more detail. So then here, if we look at the motility of the particle, in this case, it's a mean square displacement. As a function of time, we can either fix the voltage uh, uh, and change, excuse me, we can fix the UV illumination and change the voltage, and then the velocity scales with that, or we can keep the voltage that drives the particle fixed and then change the intensity of the UV light that we are shining onto the system. And again, we have a scaling of the velocity. So essentially, we have then really established that we have a controllable sort of light dependent uh, propulsion for these systems, um, which allows us really to, to program essentially how we want the, the, the velocity, the motility of the particles to change in response to an external stimulus. Now, what makes these things interesting is that using light as a vehicle to control the propulsion of the particle is very convenient. Because what we can do very easily these days is to use the machinery that is inside such a beamer, and this is called a DMD or a digital micromirror device which is a, a device where you take a design illumination pattern, you feed it through the beamer, and this is the picture that you see on the screen, and then there are mirrors inside the, 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 this device which basically project the illumination pattern, the image that you feed to the projector onto the sample. So you see here, this is a resulting illumination pattern where, for instance, we say we illuminate with UV only the left side of the screen, and then we do not illuminate with UV the right side of the, um, uh, uh, of the field of view, and then resultingly, these particles will be exposed to the UV light, but the other ones won't. And so if we do something like that, the experiments look like this. You now do not see the, um, uh, the, the light pattern because we have a filter in front of the camera that blocks the UV, but the particle starts to move. That particle on the right is very close to the edge of the illumination boundary. And if it's on the right side of that, then it goes slowly. You can already see that the particles on the left side are actually 
moving faster. And as the particle will now very soon cross the illumination boundary, then all of a sudden transition to the second state and then starts speeding up. Um, so this again, this is where we are with this at, at the moment. And then we can look at, we start, can look at, we can start, excuse me, looking at sort of what happens to large collections of particles. And so again, here we have a, a system where we have this illumination landscape, we have a field of view, it's, let's say, uh, black on the left and, and white on the right. And then after 150 seconds, we swap, okay? And you can really see that we can toggle, basically, the motility of the particles as a function of position in our sample by toggling the illumination. And we can go from a high velocity state to a low velocity state by changing the level of illumination. So essentially, with this system, and this is where we are now, and I'm very excited to see what's coming next, we have now a system of which we have spatial and temporal control of the propulsion by, uh, by light fields, uh, which then allows us to, uh, to tune uh, what's going on um, at the level of the single particle. Okay, so with that, I want to move on to the second uh, system that, that we have elaborated. And in this case, as I said, we are uh, exploiting, as I'll show you in a minute, the fact that we can reconfigure the shape of the objects by changing temperature. So before doing that, I just want to tell you how we make those particles. So we need to be able to incorporate, let's say, um, uh, thermoresponsive or, or reconfigurable elements, let's say, inside our uh, active colloidal particles. But we also, if we want to program really the way in which they move, we also want to be able to precisely decide where these responsive elements of these reconfigurable elements are within the particle. And to do that, we use a technique that we've been using for a while in my lab is a, a particle assembly technique that we call SCAPA, which stands for Sequential Capillary uh, Assisted Particle Assembly. And it is basically a glorified version of the coffee ring effect. So what we have is that we take an evaporating droplet of a particle suspension, but instead of just letting it dry on your table and give that ring-like shape uh, stain at the end, we have a, a concentration and accumulation of particles at the, moving, at, the, at the meniscus of a moving droplet. And then we drag that droplet over a substrate that has cavities in it that we call traps or, or wells. What happens in that case is that once the particle falls into the trap and the meniscus of the droplets move over, then there's a capillary force that pushes the particle inside the trap. Okay? And the movement that you see here, this sort of white stage that is barely visible on the beam, is this dense uh, uh, accumulation zone of particles close to the meniscus. And then the meniscus moves over the template, it unzips, and as it unzips, it deposits a single particle in each of the cavities that you see on the substrate. Here, there's a little bit of a, a zoomed in movie um, and where you can see the process taking place. But you will also notice that in this case, the size of the cavity, the size of the trap is larger than the size of the particle. So there is some empty space that we can leave behind. There's many details there, but without going into the details, if we tune the parameters of the deposition properly, we can control how many particles we put inside each trap. And in this case, we put, in, we put particles in one by one, which then allows us to come in with a second deposition, hence the name sequential, and kind of fill in the backspace with the second particle type. Now, in this case, you do not see the second particle type because the second particle is a microgel, which basically shrinks after the water evaporates. So you don't see much of it, but you will see it uh, in the coming movies. So by using this technique, we can compose together colloids of hard and soft particles in a well-defined uh, well way. And by controlling the geometry of the traps, by controlling how many particles we put in and where we put them, we can basically produce a library of sort of multi-material colloids that in this case comprise some rigid uh, polystyrene spheres and microgels that we can attach in a desired symmetry and we can also use microgels that are made out of different materials so we can combine different microgels. We can produce, let's say, trimers in this case with two different types of microgels connected onto a polystyrene uh, particle with a well-defined atom. And this is sort of is the key of what we use for this shape reconfigurable colloids that uh, in terms of propulsion that I'm going to show you in a minute. So just a little bit more detail of what is the material. The material here is polynipa. So this is a well-known uh, thermoresponsive polymer. Is a polymer that undergoes a swelling, this swelling transition at a, at a very well defined temperature of around 32 degrees in, in water. And by <clears throat> crossing basically that, that transition temperature, the, the, the microgel shrinks. So these are two polystyrene particles, each decorated with a, with a microgel that are connected to one another. And then we can cycle the temperature up and down very quickly by illuminating the sample uh, by, by green light. So the electrode is a gold electrode, it heats up if you shine green light on it. 
So we're locally changing the temperature, and if we go above and below this transition temperature, this microgel shrink and the microgel expands. And by shrinking and expanding, then we are actually changing the dielectric properties of the microgels. So the graph that I showed you before shows you the conductivity and the dielectric constant of a microgel as a function of temperature. And you see that in correspondence of the uh, volume phase transition temperature, when the microgel shrinks, there's also a step in the, uh, in, the, in the dielectric properties. And at the same time, the microgel shrinks. So there's a well-defined difference in the size of the microgel as we go across that, uh, that transition temperature. How do we use this for, uh, for microswimmers or for self-propelling particles? In the movie that I'm about to show, you're looking at the self-propulsion of these uh, dumbbells made out of a polystyrene particle and a polynipal microgel, uh, sandwiched between the same two electrodes that I showed you before. And then we control the local temperature, as I briefly mentioned before, by shining green light onto the, the substrate. The substrate is a gold electrode. Gold absorbs the green light and locally heats up. And while we do this, we keep the electric field constant and going on. So at low temperature, you see the particle self-propelling. You do not see the microgel is too small uh, to be able to be seen, uh, to be seen in, in, in such uh, low magnification microscopy images. But as we cross the, the transition temperature, which for this microgel is around 29 degrees, you see that the proportion of these particles changes suddenly. So the, the velocity drops now. And as we then remove the illumination, essentially as we cool down the, simple, the, the sample again, you will see very soon that the particles kind of recover their initial uh, motility. And I guess it's about to happen in, uh, in a few seconds and now. So now the temperature is, is reduced and then the particle kind of speed up again. Again, the electric field stays on all the time and is constant during this time. So we have here the possibility to sort of transition between different, let's say, dynamical states, if you want to call them, so different propulsion velocities discreetly by going through uh, by different temperature levels in the system. And it's the, 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 the temperature dependent property of the polynipon that actually makes it possible for us to program the motility. Um, we can, as I briefly hinted to before, then we can play with the chemistry of the system. So one of these microgel has a, a metacrylic acid a co monomer, the, one has, the other one has an acrylic acid co monomer, and this gives you a difference in the, in the transition temperature. So one of them, the green one, will actually de swell at a lower temperature than the red one. And so now we have these two microgel types, these two dumbbells basically that have transition from state one, say G, to state uh, two, uh, G prime at different uh, transition temperatures. And using the capillary assembly technique that I showed you before, then we can assemble these things into trimers. And so we can use a single polystyrene particles onto which we attach a green microgel and a red microgel. And now we have a system that, have, that we have particles that have, let's say, three internal states. At one state where both microgels are swollen, and we cross the first transition temperature and one microgel collapses, then we cross the second one and the second microgel collapses. And then when we go back in temperature, they re-swell in inverse order and we can go back to the initial, um, to the initial uh, state. So again, we can control the local temperature by illumination and correspondingly, you see that the trajectory of the particle changes depending on which state we find the particle. And then again, there are distinct dynamical states characterized by different uh, velocities. Uh, and we're also characterized, let's say, by the shape of the trajectory itself. So just to show you in more detail, this is a zoomed in version of such a trimen that moves at low temperature. Both microgels are uh, swollen. You see that the, the, the trajectory of this particle is sort of you know, looping around with a characteristic pitch. We transition through the first uh, state where one microgel is collapsing, the, the green microgel is collapsed and the particle actually speeds up and the pitch of the trajectory changes. So it becomes much more narrow. Then very soon the temperature will be so high that also the second microgel collapses and then essentially the particle stops moving. Uh, and then when we go back with temperature, then we'll basically recover the initial, uh, the initial motility or the initial uh, motion of these objects. So now the temperature is gradually, uh, is gradually um, reduced and, and the trajectory is color coded by the local temperature and then the proportion of the particle starts again. Okay. Um, so this is uh, just sort of scratching the surface of what we can do with the design of the systems. And I, in the interest of time, I do not want to go into too many details over here, but essentially by combining the materials and by deciding in which way we position them relative to the central cool particles, we can produce a broad range of uh, swimmers uh, that have, uh, you know, distinct internal states and distinct dynamical states 
of which we can program basically during the synthesis of the uh, of this object itself. And as a consequence of that, depending, for instance, on the internal angle that the two microdoses have with respect to the central polystyrene particles, then we achieve different sort of ways of exploring space in the different states, which by itself is somewhat interesting. How am I doing with time, Popo? Good. Yeah, it's still five minutes before your question. Okay, great. So then let me go briefly to the, the last part and to see how, knowing now that we can do this, how do we use this or how can we direct this into trying to understand how we can direct the collective behavior of these systems? And so the idea here that I just wanted to kind of think a little bit about, or at least I've been thinking about this for a while, is that now imagine if we want to control the motion of the systems, how do we do it? Okay, and so this is an earlier work that we did in my group where we had a magnetic Janus particle, and these were particles that were propelled by the same electric fields, but I had a magnetic cap. And by virtue of having this magnetic cap, we could apply a magnetic field that changes the orientation of the propulsion. And then if we apply randomized magnetic fields, essentially we are controlling the rotational diffusivity of the particle with an external field. And then what we wanted to see is basically what was, was, uh, was, what, what was happening if we superimpose, let's say, a motility landscape in, in the form of this checkered board. And you see that if we find the particle into the gray uh, squares, then we say, okay, in this region, the particle is a high rotational diffusivity. And then as it goes into the white squares, then we say, okay, in this region, the particle is a low rotational diffusivity. Okay. And we could do the same thing with the propulsion velocity. But the core of this, of how we control that, is that we need to tell say the machinery that control this particle, where is the particle and what should the local velocity or the local rotation diffusivity be based on the particle position. And so this really becomes a control problem. And the idea is that now we want to know basically where is the particle position at time t. And then based on the particle position at time t, we need to update, let's say, the motility of the particle. And this takes a finite time. This is an electronic system. We need first to detect where the particle is. We need to uh, uh, find the position of the particle, and then we need to take to tell the electronics the particle was here. Please change, or oh, without the please, it's a machine. Change <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the 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 stimulus in in that specific way. Um, when I went just as a side joke, I just visited people that had Alexa at home, and I was always saying, "Please, Alexa, can you play them?" So it's great to speak. You don't need to say please. <laughs> um, and so the simplest way in which we control that is basically by a, a very simple model, a simple model, very simple control scheme that is called the zero order hold model. And this model is basically telling you, I detect the particle position here until the next point. Keep that variable constant. And then as you do as you do that, you can see that there is a delay in updating basically the motility of the particle based on the detection. And this delay is crucial in controlling the overall uh, response of the systems. And in particular here we did numerical simulations that show that by changing the delay time of the update of the particle rotational diffusivity in this case in such a checkerboard pattern, there is an optimal delay time for which we get an accumulation of particles inside the regions of high rotational diffusivity. And very briefly, the reason for this is that because of the delay that we have in updating the particle motility, uh, there is, we end up having an asymmetry of transport of particles across boundaries. So now imagine that we have a particle in a region of low rotational diffusivity, so the particle is almost moving ballistically, and then by the time we know where the particle is next, the particle will have already traveled a certain distance inside a region of high rotational diffusivity, and now when we update the motility, then this particle starts diffusing around. And so the, and it will take a longer time for a, for a diffusive particle to travel that distance than it would for a ballistic particle. And so here, the control and the delay that we impose to the system is then essential in determining the global response of the, of the, of the material itself. So if we now go back, and all of this was done with completely model systems, magnetic particles that we, 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 we could only control one at a time, uh, and then this was then based on, on very simple uh, numerical simulations. But if we now take a step back and, for instance, look at the case of the, uh, the microdot systems that I showed you before, if you paid attention to uh, some of the movies that I was showing, so here you see that when I change the temperature, the, the shrinkage of this particle is not instantaneous. It takes a characteristic time, and that's a characteristic, let's say, material property. Okay, this is the time that it takes for that for the water to be squeezed out of that polynipum sponge, and this depends on the size of the object, depends on the cross-linking density, and so on and so forth. 
So if we now start thinking about in terms of transition between the different states, there is a characteristic in it. And this is a, an intrinsic time scale, uh, an intrinsic time scale that depends on the material. But this is then the key to control, let's say, the collective behavior of these objects. And so that is basically where we would like to go as an outlook and where I'm very interested to have uh, to hear ideas uh, from you. And in the first case, what we are looking now is the case of the light control particles. We can really control spatially and temporally how we switch the, the, the illumination pattern. And so the rate at which we do that and the length scale of these patterns relative to an intrinsic length scale and time scale of the motility of the particle now becomes important. Something that I'm very excited uh, uh, as well is that this light control also gives us the possibility of doing something much more complicated. So we can do real time tracking of certain particles in, in, the, in the field of view and then project a light pattern that is dependent on the position of specific particles into the system. Okay, so then we can use particles as, you know, shepherds, uh, shepherd dogs and other particles that can be the sheep and see how they can be uh, responding to, uh, to, this, to the motility that is imposed by, uh, by them. And then finally, when it comes to the shape responsive particles, this is also something I'm super excited about. So when we started making these active colloids with the, with the scapa that I showed you before, the first generation of them were all made by rigid particles. All these three particles that you see here are polystyrene particles stuck together. The second generation is what I showed you today, where we have one rigid particle and two soft particles of which we can control the, the relative position. But what we can do now are objects that look like this. So we have now a combination of, uh, of assembly technique and printing technique that I'll show you in the next slide that allows us really to have much more freedom in the design of these objects. And so this is a process that we have sort of dubbed uh, uh, printing on particles. And it's a process by which we deposit regular arrays of particles onto a substrate using the capillary deposition technique that I showed you before. And then we transfer them into a polymerizable resin that we polymerize using a 2 photon analytography system. So we can essentially write links of quote unquote any material between quote unquote any particle to produce much more complex uh, shapes. So for instance, in this image before, we deposited particles in a rectangular array by capillary depositions, and then we decide which ones we want to link with which link. Okay. These images are using a, a rigid link, link, sorry, it's a stiff um, uh, photoresist that we use. But then what we have uh, recently also been exploring is the fact that we can actually print polynipum links between these particles. So now we have the possibility of printing responsive, temperature responsive links and produce objects that look like that. So in this case, you have these two dumbbells that are linked between these this polynipum strands. And depending on what is the cross-linking density of the polynipum, and depending on the light, the intensity of the light, we produce basically materials that have different times, different characteristic rates from swelling and deswelling. And by doing that, we now have a much more sensitive or finer way of controlling the characteristic response time in the transition between these different states. Um, so we are now in, in, in the process of really making them in a robust and reproducible way so that we can start we can start looking at the motility of these objects over large ensembles of those. Um, yeah, but this is exciting. All right, so with that, I would like to conclude. Uh, so very briefly summarizing, I showed you the two different ways in which we can currently program the motility of uh, our active college by using light or by using temperature responsive materials and sort of guided you towards what we would like to do uh, with those uh, or look at in the future when it comes to the collective Before I finish, of course, I have to thank the people who've done uh, the work. So this has been the result of many years of, of work. So it was the result of previous uh, uh, postdocs and, and PhD students and master students uh, in the group who by now have left, left the group and are in these <coughs> places. Uh, currently in the group, uh, the Willy and Federico have been working on the light responsive systems. Schwitting and Steven have been uh, working with the temperature responsive um, uh, micro swimmers. And then we also enjoy collaborations with external collaborators throughout the years and funding from uh, ETH and from DRC. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
Yes. So, in principle, we can. In the just sense that. The oh, sorry. So the question was whether we can a priori predict what the motility is going to be uh, by adding particles of known properties rather than just doing it and checking afterwards. Um, so we can, in the sense that if that that uh, up to a certain level. So in the sense that the the, the prediction of that velocity. It's well defined. So if you measure, let's say, the, the size and the dielectric properties of the particle as a function of frequency, and in the case of these microgels we did, you have to do dielectric spectroscopy, but then you can be predictive in, in what the velocity is going to be. Um, one important point to mention, though, is that what you measure in these techniques, these are sort of ensemble values that you get out. You have invariably polydispersity, both in size and in dielectric properties. Then that causes a range of different motilities for a specific design. Uh, but as long as your system is ideally monodispersed, then you can do that. So the step there, the, the sort of the, the logic behind this is that you first characterize the relevant property, and then you use that to, to design the, the swimmer. Let's take one more question, and then we can go for a couple. Uh, very nice work. Um, when I think about products, still, uh, medical applications, uh, there's a lot of uh, for me to think about like changing its own fields like that is dependent. I guess I was I was wondering whether you know can you do a third generation when you actually have like um, different internal states that you have like one kind whether you can maybe go in the direction where you have like interesting properties and functional behaviors without some sort of external fields. I was wondering whether this I'm gonna give you my honest answer. I think what you see here just works in the lab. Okay. So because if this works, for instance, on electrodes that have to be prepared in, in a specific way, uh, that have to be clean, already you see that in the lab, even particles stuck, they, they, they stick, they don't move, and so on and so forth. So it's very, the conditions for which this works are very delicate. Uh, so I, even though I love the field, I mean, I think that to translate this type of simple swimmers into biomedical applications, for me, it's something that is extremely far in the future, if at all possible. But one can think about the strategies that you can design the swimmers with to go in that direction. Okay, and so one can think um, about, for instance, um, and this is what we're trying to do at the moment as well, combining biological objects, which have somewhat inbuilt robustness to be able to swim under certain conditions with functional particles that then can carry, let's say, the biomedical function with them. And so this would be, you know, combining, uh, trying to, to overcome certain obstacles uh, by combining systems that are completely different in nature, um, which would allow you to have a much more robust um, uh, vehicle. Nonetheless, the, let's say the logic remains the same. I would say. So that I think what I find is helpful from a materials design perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.